from my point of view, if you sort of follow where the genes are and follow where the guns are, and you think of the economic level as just sort of fictional, largely, um, everything makes a lot more sense. Mm. Go, what, what do you mean by that, Gone? Well, it's just the fragility of the economic system, you know, the fragility of the credit system. Um, in, let's see, maybe. Oh, okay. So at the end of Fight Club, where the protagonist blows up all the computers that store all the credit records, and you see, oh my God, at the physical level, the whole credit score and, and credit record system is actually very vulnerable. Um, or at the level of, um, you know, Wall Street street trading, the fact that all the trading happens basically on the east shore of Jersey and southern Manhattan in a, in a little pocket of, of delusion that, that could be wiped out by a small tactical nuke or a little bit of a bioweapon or almost anything right. to crash the economy. Right. And then what do you have left? Jeans and people and guns and real estate and stuff. Yeah, it is. It is fascinating how a lot of economic phenomena are are really kind of quite superficial reflections of much deeper um, objective phenomena that are much harder, more concrete. Um, and I mean, one thing that's really kind of that I've really kind of opened my eyes to recently is is also like the, the role of intelligence in in economic phenomena, because you know. I guess for a while, I guess for most of my adult life, I did kind of have the the kind of standard kind of leftist uh, presumption around things like IQ and intelligence. I was never like, you know, uh, vehemently opposed to discussions about intelligence or IQ or anything like that. I, um, but I was, I was basically kind of swimming in that uh, water for a while. So basically did, I basically did kind of think, I guess my mental model was for a while um, that most of, uh, you know, the distribution of resources in society is a function of sort of unjust historical advantages and domination. And, uh, and I, I mean, to be fair, I still think a lot of that uh, <clears throat> does still exist. And I do think it's, it's remains to be underestimated by uh, people who are like gung ho about capitalism. So I'm definitely not throwing all of that out, but I, I guess I, I have only really recently started to kind of also accept how, the reality is that like under capitalism money flows to intelligence massively. Um, and, and that doesn't make it, I, that still doesn't make it just to me. Um, but in some ways it makes it even more scary. It makes it even more perverse. Um, but the point is that it's, it's a real thing and it's a real process. It's not arbitrary. It's not like, it's not like who has, who has, um, what, and the distribution of money is this kind of like, um, uh, this fake thing that is totally a kind of like superficial um, maintenance of power relations. It's like, no capital, like whatever you want to say about capitalism. And I think there are lots of good reasons to critique it. It is basically a super dynamic system for uh, moving resources to people who have uh, intelligence <laughs> in some sense. And it's a brutal process of doing that. Um, and yeah, I guess, I mean, I don't really have a, a massively profound uh, upshot of this. I'm just saying uh, it, it's interesting because I have only really started to kind of see how real that is. And it's rather profound when you think about it. Well, I think one of the upshots is, um, you know, the more that you believe these important psychological traits are heritable and depend on genes, the less you blame people for whatever level of them they happen to have, right? So if you think intelligence is something you learn through 10,000 hours of practicing some skill or something where your parents provided the right environment and you end up not very smart, then who's culpable? You or your parents? That's it. Whereas if you think like I do, that it's largely a roll of the genetic dice and people vary in it and it's not their fault, then I think that that opens the way for a much more kind of generous and accepting society where instead of you know, blaming and oppressing people for not being smart and then pretending IQ doesn't exist, you know, of course, there's a, there's a, there's a bell curve and 
what are the implications of that? Well, if people don't have the intelligence to like earn a living in, in society, maybe there should be universal basic income as a safety net. Right. Or maybe we do need universal health care, particularly if it's mentally simpler to manage it. Right. Or maybe we should have an educational system that focuses on basic life skills and like how to have a happy marriage and parenting and manage a house and manage your money rather than assuming, you know, the goal of education is create as many PhDs as possible. So to me, it's, it's, you know, describing society realistically is almost always the right way to get more humane policies. I really agree with that. I think that's like a, a, a really good, slogan for any like genuinely radical, like any genuinely radical politics would have to maintain that slogan. And to me, like, I mean, this sort of goes back to what I was saying before, but to me, radical politics could only mean taking that idea more radically than most people are willing to take it. Um, so yeah, that, that, that definitely squares with what I've been thinking. So one thing I want to ask you next is a little bit about, you mentioned it before, but we didn't pause to talk about it is, uh, your interest in polyamory. Yeah. Um, Maybe I, I kind of want to take a bathroom break, though. Is that cool? Oh, sure. Yeah, right. yeah. We can pick up. We can pick sure. up on that one. All right. Back from the bathroom break. Just ready to go. All right. Cool. <laughs> um, anyway. All oh, right. So uh, you're working on a book. Is that right? On polyamory? I'm thinking about working on a book. Oh, okay. I'm not not officially. I'm not sure whether I'm going to work on it or not. It's I'm kind of on the knife edge. Oh, I mean, sorry gonna... if I leaked it. Uh, no, 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 no. Like... <laughs> uh, I'm going to teach a course uh, I think it's the first course on polyamory in a psychology department. Oh, really? Uh, this fall, so it's called polyamory and open sexuality. Hmm. I'm bringing together a lot of the psychological literature and the research on you know who does this new sexual lifestyle and does it work and are they crazy and how does it compare to monogamy and oh, okay, what are the evolutionary origins of different mating systems? So it's a fascinating area. It's a fascinating subculture. Um, I'm just not sure yet uh, how to how to talk about it. Hmm. I mean, to to me, the problem is like a lot of edgy sexual subcultures, like BDSM kink, um, or like you know gay or lesbian um, culture. A lot of the polyamory folks are very very leftist and very SJW and sort of into mm. this intersectionality stuff and I'm not that. So <laughs> what remains to be seen is could could you do a kind of you know realistic poly book that isn't based on kind of leftist or blank slate assumptions about how human sexuality works. Okay. So that's really interesting. So do you want to give us sort of the quick and dirty of what is the kind of evolutionary psychology of polyamory? Like why do you think it might be a preferable? I mean, for most of my career uh, studying human mate choice and sexuality, I kind of had this monogamist assumption baked into a lot of my research that uh, pair bonding is important, that it happens, and, and uh, humans are a particularly pair bondy species mm-hmm. compared to other great apes, and that monogamous lifelong marriage is kind of a natural um, extrapolation of that romantic pair bonding. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really question that, um, but I have started to question it the last couple of years. Uh, If you read books like um, Sex at Dawn by Christopher Ryan, I think it gets a lot of things wrong about the science, but it does open the possibility that we've been kind of projecting monogamous marriage backwards into prehistory more than we should have done Mm. right that we have this cultural institution and it's it's a legal binding agreement between two citizens and we sort of treat it like it's a natural state of being that would have applied to all prehistoric and historical humans so i've been questioning that okay that's interesting um do you want to tell me a little bit more about the the positive case for why polyamory might be more uh, suitable for humans? <clears throat> I think the positive case for polyamory is that 
for some people, some of the time, it can work and it can be really fun. It can be a very enriching way to live that actually nurtures social bonds through sexual bonds and creates a sense of community and network much better than these sort of isolated monogamous pairs tends to do. So if I was, let's say, a leftist revolutionary or an alt-right revolutionary, <laughs> and I wanted to build a movement and create something that was attractive to people and where, you, you know, you could build your little tribe, then polyamory might be quite a powerful way to do that because you're knitting together people, not just through conversation, but through sex. So I think it has upsides for the individual or the sort of clan or tribe level of, of organization. And I think it can also potentially, if you're raising kids, be helpful because it means you might have extra sort of co-parents around, extra adults sort of in the mix mm -hmm. who can help you do some of the childcare burden. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. I could see that. So what's kind of coming into focus for me as a revolutionary is you have like a tribe of people who, so basically you have like the optimal number of people in the clan and it's you, you minimize all of the kind of the wasteful signaling and the wasteful uh, kind of channeling of your desire into consumerism and all, all the, all the manifold ways in which most human beings have their energies and time wasted and manipulated uh, in this group that no longer does any of that or minimizes it as much as possible. And they have uh, a polyamorous arrangement. So everyone takes everyone as lovers and everyone kind of shares the kids. Um, and yeah. Um, I mean, for example, to get back to our conversation about spent and runaway yeah. consumerism, right. I don't know any polyamorous people who are runaway consumerists who mm. are sort of really into shopping and, and spending and image and, and materialism. That's not their hobby, right? Courting other people and having sex with them and managing their relationships is their hobby. So it's very radical in that mm. perspective that you're, you're putting your time and energy into your relationships which is something everybody gives lip service to being a good thing, put it into your relationships and not into materialist acquisition. Right. So, I mean, I could see a critique that sort of runs like this, like what ends up happening then is you end up wasting a lot of your resources and time and energy in uh, what is ultimately kind of wasteful, like pleasure seeking or something like that. It sounds like very conservative, right? Um, but in, in some sense, you can kind of read that as like our reward system also gone amok uh, or kind of kind of uh, hot wired in a way that is perhaps like self-destructive. And of course, you know, so uh, you often have and this is almost a trope in kind of like left wing, like radical left wing communities. Right. Like you have this problem of polyamory tending to kind of devolve into, uh, you know, conflict and mistrust. And uh, soured, soured relationships, right? Or some, or, or you know, the one one guy in the group like fucking everyone's wife and and everything sort of uh, failing from there. You know what I mean? Um, so I wonder if you have. I'm sure you've thought about that, obviously. But what what would you say to that? I haven't thought enough about the sort of runaway hedonism issue, but um, yeah, come to think of it, so so one issue is. Monogamous marriage and pair bonding and exclusivity are kind of associated with this sort of serious, puritanical, purposeful approach to life. Like you get married to have kids and to get a mortgage and get your shit together. And polyamory has this sort of image of happy-go-lucky, carefree, hedonistic, pleasure-seeking, irresponsible, frankly, and, a and, and sort of right. directionless, where it's like... Oh, there's a shiny new person on the horizon. I'll court them and bring them into my, my triad or whatever. The idea you could do polyamory with a purpose where you're actually using, you know, sexual bonds to build up a social network that has some other greater purpose isn't something I've seen discussed very much. Okay. But I think it's something you could totally, uh, 
you could totally do it. And in fact, I do know a couple of subcultures, but I won't mention, where they're largely polyamorous and the people tend to pick lovers who are within the subculture and they pick them largely because it'll be kind of strategically good to create certain alliances. Hmm. So I can see that happening. That's um, interesting. I think that's a, uh, I think that might be the title of your book. Polyamory with a purpose. That's, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah. folks. <laughs> um, that's interesting. So, and then the other thing you mentioned was doesn't, doesn't devolve into drama. Right. All the time. And I think that's a big, big problem. And I think there's two roots to it. One is, you know, monogamous marriage is this amazing civilizational invention that's been refined over generations to have certain features, most of which we don't consciously understand, but which are there to make it so it's kind of tolerable for a, for a primate like us. Polyamory has really only been around in its modern form since about 1990. And we have not built up that toolbox of cultural innovations and ways to manage relationships and, and rituals and norms and, and all of that stuff that helps monogamy work. So if you compare them head to head, right, marriage versus poly, polyamory or close versus open relationships and ask like which ones last longer, which lead to more drama. Poly doesn't look that great at the moment, mm -hmm. but you're basically comparing like mm -hmm. how, how, how well does, so, does someone run someone who's been doing it for 20 years or a toddler. My hope is that eventually you could develop this toolbox of cultural innovations to support polyamory that would decrease all the drama, help people manage jealousy better, uh, help people choose their mates better. You know, figure out how to have a richer language for describing what kinds of relationships are we going to have and all of that. Mm. But I think it'll take a, a generation to do that. Right. So that is very interesting. And it does. So it does have a lot of kind of left wing connotations, as you mentioned. Um, but and yet you do you do have these other kind of, you know, right leaning uh, intuitions, mm -hmm. I think. And so. Do you want to say a little bit about how you see, because I think you do, you do think that there is a kind of uh, <clears throat> potential joining of polyamory and uh, some more right-wing intuitions. I wonder if you want to say a word about that at all. Yeah, well, okay, a couple of experiences. Like, for those of your listeners who are familiar with the Vikings TV series, which is kind of campy, but I love it. Um, there's a certain scene where one of the, uh, Vikings gets married and kind of shares his new bride with one or maybe both of his brothers. And the bride is kind of puzzled by this. Like, don't you guys get jealous? And one of the young Vikings says, no, we do not get jealous. We are Vikings. It's not something we do. And I thought, I wonder if there's some historical precedent for polyamory being, let's say, an important part of European civilization at certain points in time that's kind of been suppressed by the marriage ideology. Mm. Also, I think, you know, if it's true that polyamory can help turn you know, acquaintanceships into friendships, into sexual relationships, into social bonds, then that should be able to work for any subculture, any political movement. Okay. So it's, it's a kind of like your example of the Vikings, it seems to be kind of suggesting that polyamory might be a model for almost like a, a an even more supercharged like family values kind of yeah kind of like a, a neo pagan tribal family values mindset okay right where I mean, there's a, there's a certain intimacy, let's say, that comes if you're a guy and you have a, a female lover and she has another, you know, male lover and you're what's called metamors. Um, for that to be sustainable, typically you have to kind of make friends with the other guy and figure out a way to coexist that's based on a kind of shared enthusiasm for that woman, hmm. right? So if nothing else, you know, you both love that woman and you 
like can talk about why and and it like her pros and cons and shit that annoys you about her and stuff you love and it can escalate that male to male bond very quickly and i'm sure the same would happen with two women who are metamors who share the same guy so it doesn't just stitch together people sort of pairwise it also creates these little triads mm. and i could imagine that working fairly effectively in in a kind of clan structure so that almost all the adults are kind of knit together by the, these various sexual and, and friendly bonds. Mm. Now, of course, there will be drama and conflict and jealousy to some degree. Mm -hmm. But if you had the right social norms, I think on balance, it might be better to have that kind of clan structure rather mm. than one that's just exclusive pair bonded couples who don't really interact that much with other couples in any meaningful way. It is really fascinating to think to think it through because I definitely like what you say about, you know, with a purpose. That's very attractive to me because I think, you know, when I think about like my ideal kind of human situation, and it's actually something I've been thinking about recently, like throughout my life, I've always gravitated towards like groups with some type of intense purpose. Like that's always what I've found myself wanting and trying to make or trying to be a part of. And I've, and I've done it in a few different ways, but through, through, over time. Um, but that's kind of like, I think always what I've longed for is like to be in a, in, a, in, a, in a group of people in which I'm like deeply embedded, in which I feel like authentic belonging. And I know that everyone has my back and they fucking love me. And I fucking love, love them like crazy. And there's absolute trust. And we're all dedicated to doing something that's like big and badass and like that's kind of in one way or another that's like always been kind of like my dream or like my my kind of guiding fantasy of like what human life should be um and in different ways i've i've always tried to kind of seek that out and so obviously kind of radical politics is one format for trying to do that and there's a certain like left-wing uh image trying to do this it's like the activist group or whatever um and it has lots of different permutations um but it's interesting because uh, it it's interesting how on the right wing it seems to me that the the, the typical right wing uh, interpolation of this is the family um, traditionally. But what's interesting about the family is like there's no there's typically not a social purpose other than the the reproduction of the family and the, yeah. and the protection of the family. So I wonder if that's kind of like the one of the key points here is that like. The, so long as you're only interested in the family and reproducing the family and protecting, you know, your offspring or whatever, it makes sense why people cling to kind of family, the family unit and family values and traditional monogamy. But polyamory seems to kind of open up to um, what if you want to do something larger yeah. with your reproductive, with your life, like with your reproductive, with your whole life, your whole being, like your, your family and your reproductive project. Like what if you want to do something more purposeful than just reproduce that what if you want to do that with some kind of social or political mission, then suddenly polyamory kind of makes more sense because it has all of these kinds of, like you said, almost political features of like alliance building and uh, relationship building. And, and that also could help to explain why polyamory is more popular on the left, at least anecdotally, it seems like in radical left wing groups anyway, uh, or like there's a certain affinity with like progressivism and polyamory. It could be because, um, there's a kind of isomorphy in the sense that left-wing groups tend to have some, at least some nominal sense of like larger social purpose. Um, and there's something about like polyamory that jives with that. I don't know. I'm kind of just riffing. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so if you ask what, what would monogamy with a purpose look like, right? That would basically mean having kids. Right. Um, that's the purpose. And I did, I actually did a little Twitter poll about uh, what do you think of the most is the key feature of, of, of monogamy, like functionally. And, and, uh, you know, the options were like, um, stability, raising kids together, sexual exclusivity, division of labor. Almost nobody chose sexual exclusivity or division of labor. It was all about stability for the kids. Hmm. Those were the big rationales for monogamy. And I think that's heartening because it implies 
sexual exclusivity might not be doing that much work in terms of why mar monogamous marriage is appealing to people. But you're right, it all kind of boils down to this amoral nepotism, where the point of the married couple is basically produce their kids. It's not even to reproduce the family unit at some abstract level. It's their genes. That's what they're reproducing. And then you can have a, like a social level of description that says, well, monogamous marriage is also helpful because it kind of redistributes the women and the men in such a way that nobody kind of monopolizes everybody, the other sex and yada, yada. But um, if your polyamory means the the only ulterior mission of your polyamory is like maximize sexual pleasure. Or if you're a bunch of neurotic people, like maximize interesting drama and conflict that you can gossip about. If that's your only goal, it seems extremely shallow and dumb. Um, if, you, if you have an ulterior mission that's more like socialist revolution or preserve our ethnic group against other groups or help build our little um, town or whatever. Uh, that to me seems a lot more meaningful. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, one problem that you have for this is that kind of the closest examples you get so far. Yeah. They don't look so good, but you make a very good point that that is to be expected because this idea is in its infancy. Um, all right. I mean, the, the, probably the highest visibility examples and, and, to be, and probably the best, you know, uh, actually most ac accurate examples so far would be like cults <laughs> in yeah. some, many, many situ or many groups that basically become cults or kind of look like cults. Um, but, but that actually drives with something that I've been saying for a while, which is like very kind of hard to sell. <laughs> and it is admittedly very dubious. Um, but I've long believed that like the actually correct uh, an effective kind of revolutionary political group would have to look something kind of like a cult. Um, but that all cults up until now have just, uh, been like, you know, suboptimal, you know? Um, yeah. and I think it's like a very delicate, very difficult, fragile, uh, thing that is just admittedly highly vulnerable to, uh, certain uh, problems, like namely, uh, kind of like, uh, power hungry, individuals kind of like going to the top and everything getting sort of subsumed under like charismatic individual who becomes the leader and then everything goes crazy. Um, I think like cults are, you know, highly vulnerable to that kind of thing. And what we think of when we think of cult is basically that type of problem. Um, but again, I just see that, I see that as like an institutional design, uh, problem due to it being tried so rarely and also like massive selection problems, like the types of people who yes. generally gravitate towards that sort of thing in this like early adoption phase is like, of course it's like a highly volatile type of situation. But the point being like, I'm actually quite drawn to the idea of you have a small group of people uh, who fucking love each other like crazy and are unified on some belief and some mission. And they just go crazy on that mission mm -hmm. to the point of becoming almost unintelligible to like the society at large because they're so obsessed with, protecting each other and promoting each other and, and promoting the, the most importantly, the mission, the goal or the value at the, at the, at the, at the, at the core of it yeah. and just living so uh, wholeheartedly for that mission. That to me sounds like the definition of mm -hmm. a meaningful, powerful, satisfying human life. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> cult is such a disparaging term, but a cult is basically just a clan on a mission, right? right? It's a clan with a, a goal that goes beyond just Darwinian self-replication. Now, typically cults have some bullshit, religious, supernatural, transcendental purpose that doesn't make any rational sense. And so they kind of fizzle out. Right. But, you know, if you imagine a kind of clan with a mission and a good social organization, and it has, you know, a realistic, um, plan that's kind of grounded in evidence and what's achievable. That would be hugely exciting, and I think a lot of people would buy into that, even if it took a little more work, you know, than sort of nuclear family amoral nepotism. But there are huge barriers to it. Like once you step outside the monogamist mindset, then little things like the entire spatial organization of society and real estate and, and residence, you know, spaces suddenly seems really oppressive. 
right? And and you think, okay, where can I find a, a compound that has about you know twenty bedrooms, ten <laughs> bathrooms, a big communal kitchen, and where a bunch of us can buy it, but crucially, where we can have control over who lives there and where we're not subject to like anti discrimination law. Mm. That's very, very tricky. Is that hard to find? Or is that is that like mostly um I think it's impossible. If you have I mean, enough money though, I'm sure you well, can make that, right? I don't if one person owned it and they sort of allowed others to live on their property, mm-hmm. you could do that. But there's no legal mechanism, I think, in Britain or America for people to have a kind of shared ownership of a property where they'd have true freedom of association and they could actually control who else lives there. Okay. That's the crucial thing. That's interesting. Um, I mean, here I'm, here I'm really going out on a limb cause I haven't thought this through at all, but I'm uh, very interested in how things like this will be changed by blockchain. Mm-hmm. Cause it seems to me that blockchain is going to open up a lot of really weird opportunities for groups of people to basically wire themselves into these uh, contracts that are currently not feasible. Yeah. Um, but with blockchain, you can, you can imagine how like small groups with some sort of weird creative mission that kind of doesn't fit into kind of contemporary, like legal forms, for instance, kind of like you're talking about right now, uh, blockchain, when it becomes widely accessible, <clears throat> it seems to, I'm not an expert on it yet, but it seems that it is, it basically portends the possibility for groups of people to, uh, create in- incredibly powerful and complicated, but also um, you know, self-enforcing uh, chains of accountability. Um, and so I find that extremely uh, interesting for precisely these sorts of uh, kind of harebrained schemes. Yeah, that would be super exciting. And, you know, particularly if you could incentivize the, the, the development of new kind of blockchain, like polyamorous clan contract <laughs> systems where like, you yes. never invents an awesome way to do that would get like, half a percent of everybody's income who does it or something. Um, but the problem is, you know, if you have your little clan, whatever it is, let's say it's a, um, say it's a black nationalist clan or Muslim clan or white nationalist clan, or it's a bunch of straight pronatalist breeders, right? And somebody wants to live in that place because it seems attractive and they have a nice hot tub but they're the wrong race, religion, uh, sexual orientation, that clan would get clobbered Mm. by the government at the moment for being discriminatory. Right. So we we don't have true freedom of association in a way that would allow those kind of blockchain-based clans to, to operate. I see what you're saying, except that the thing about blockchain potentially is that it wouldn't, it doesn't need legal enforcement. And it can operate underneath the legal institutions, basically, because it's a sec- it's effectively self enforcing. Um, right? But still, right? If you have this straight Christian breeder cult, and they've got a nice a nice big house, you know, wherever in in, in Malibu, and then the gay couple next door is like, we'd quite like to live there, mm-hmm. and they're told no, you, you have to have like three or four babies in a natural way, right? Then the government would right. step in and go, naughty, 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 you can't do that. Right. It's a good point. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it might just be the case that uh, issues that are sort of territorial or like linked to physical um, structures such as land or whatever are, are probably going to sort of stay within government control relatively longer than other things, but you could, you can certainly imagine, uh, different types of like autonomous relationships, um, being substantially modified by this type of technology, um, to the degree that those relationships aren't basically under the auspices of, of like law enforcement. I don't know. Yeah. You just, for the foreseeable future, you'd kind of have to fly under the radar, like the, um, you know, like the, uh, polygamous, um, triad in that tv series big love where they get the three adjacent suburban houses and you know the guy lives in the middle house but the co the co-wives live on planking out in planking houses and Hmm. most of the people in the neighborhood kind of know that they're they're in a 
polygamous relationship, but but nobody makes a fuss, and then the government doesn't crush them. Right. Yeah, I mean, you could almost imagine like something like a Silk Road for like relationships or something. Uh, anyway, I'm I'm getting real pie in the sky now, but it's super fascinating. I mean, what else? So, um, uh, one thing I wanted to um, ask you about we talked about this, we talked about this a little bit before, but um, because you're very interested in free speech, and so am I. And I was actually recently uh, looking at some of the data on attitudes towards free speech in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, it was pretty striking. I mean, it's not that surprising, uh, I think, for anyone kind of watching what's going on and uh, who's been watching over the past few decades. It won't be surprising, but it is pretty striking uh, when you look in the data that attitude support for free speech has been on the decline um, in, a, in a pretty stark way. Um, and it's kind of interesting because it's not, it's, not, it's not super linear. It's like in the 90s, there's a big dip. And then today there's a big dip. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been generally on the decline, but there are two kind of like noticeable dips. Um, and I, I, I found it very interesting. And I, uh, so this is like, I was, this, I was looking at the general social survey um, from like several decades ago to, to today. And uh, I, I was curious to see if political scientists have studied this. It's like an eminently political mm-hmm. question. And it's, it's exactly the type of thing that political scientists do study. Mm-hmm. Um, and like the study of public opinion towards free speech is not a literature, as far as I can tell. Oh wow! Um, That's I mean, surprising. I mean, I'm sure someone. I'm, I don't mean to throw under the bus whoever you know is out there who probably has studied it, and yeah. I just didn't see it. But it's certainly not a kind of high visibility uh, or substantial literature like I find. I, I was not, at least in my short search, able to find anything on it. And so, the, just the, the low hanging fruit sort of question mm-hmm. is uh, just like what it, what is what is like the cause of of, the, of declining support for free speech. Um, and it's easy to kind of think about a lot of possibilities, but I was curious, um, if you have a hypothesis, cause I already have this data cooked up and it'd be, uh, interesting to, to look further to test the hypothesis and maybe write a paper on it. Yeah. Cause I'm curious, like why exactly, um, what, what exactly would make people over time <clears throat> less supportive of free speech? Well, it seems like it's particularly among the young, right? There's a huge age gradient, I think, mm. where the young are less pro-free speech, okay. the older more pro-free speech. I think women generally are not as pro-free speech as men, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, I think, well, honestly, part of it has to do with the percentage of young people who go to universities. So I think, you know, when I went to university, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40% of young people started and, and then maybe two thirds of them graduated. I think now it's in the U.S. over half start university, but only half of them graduate. Hmm. So there's a huge kind of um, waste of human potential and money and hmm. in terms of not getting degrees. And the kind of minimum IQ that you need to get into university now is quite a bit lower than it was 20 or 50 years ago. So it's just not as selective. That means there's a lot of folks who go into universities. They realize, oh, shit, I'm not actually very competitive here. I was told I do okay. I'm not doing okay. I can't do the kinds of hard classes, science and math classes that I know will get me a job. I can't do engineering. I have to do something softer. Why, why am I failing? What can I care about that salvages my identity that makes me feel okay about this? And I think they tend to, the folks who are in that boat tend to sort of gravitate towards social justice activism partly to kind of explain why am I not (laughs) a great engineering major? Oh, systemic oppression, systemic racism, systemic um, sexism, whatever. But also, if you're not getting kind of grounded in science and reason and evidence as part of your your university degree, if you're getting a bunch of postmodern theory thrown at you, then... um, you just think all 
speech is just another domain of politics. It's just another domain of violence. It's just another way for people to oppress each other. And free speech is just an excuse to, like, um, amp up the amount of violence in society. And, and they, they think free speech is, is like, uh, it's an arms race. And moreover, they know they would lose, right? If it comes down to an, a set of, you know, if it's logic and reason and evidence versus subjective personal belief and anecdote, they know they would lose. So they have to use the only weapon they've got left, which is censorship. That's interesting. So, I mean, because I think one, there, you could collect data on uh, college enrollment, things like that, and put that up against the, the free speech data. Um, and I know that, you know, I think in the 90s, too, in the first big wave of political correctness, it was also a campus phenomenon. Um, and so I wonder if there are corresponding uh, sort of bumps in college enrollment. Um I don't know. I mean, the, the, the one of my kind of pet hypotheses on, on this front is I'm very interested in how the in, in what the role of the media environment is mm-hmm. in inducing these sorts of um, shifts in, in in public speech, because I think what what I find so fascinating about the early '90s is you have all of these kind of high profile cases of uh, that that have like significant media uh, you know, significant examples of sort of mm-hmm. media power that people were kind of, uh, didn't realize, uh, until they occurred. So something like OJ, like the OJ case is like a very fascinating Mm -hmm. and powerful example. Um, where it's like one of the first cases in which, um, a legal trial is really like being played out through the television, um, in, in, in a significant sense, or at least in, 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 in a sense, in a sense that hadn't quite occurred in that way. Um, and people are like, whoa, like, (laughs) what you, the words you use in our institutions can be leveraged for like extraordinary kind of, uh, power. And, and I mean, in the case of OJ Simpson, it was like Johnny Cochran's kind of like game around race. Yeah. It worked so brilliantly. Yeah. And he was kind of like a visionary in some sense because he saw what you could achieve. Um, if, if you wanted to play that game, because it was like so kind of obvious to most people watching it that like he, you know, OJ, OJ did it, uh, or at least like an objective reading of the evidence. I think that's is that controversial to say nowadays. I, I think that's like kind of why people I think admit it's, I that, think right? It's okay, dead obvious he did it. Okay, I think that's pretty. Um, I think that's pretty widely accepted right now. I'm just checking yeah. that that's not like a. Uh, a I mean, at least <laughs> he, he lost the civil case. We can say that. Yeah, he lost the civil yeah. case, which is. Yeah. So my point is my point just being that this is like a really powerful case in which um, people are seeing like oh wow like the way that you kind of leverage moral intuitions can can override like obvious facts uh, in really effective ways and this is playing out in, on on a kind of uh, high visibility platform in a way that it hasn't been before and so I kind of always saw. Uh, examples such as that as uh, being a possible kind of cause or at least one of the kind of motor forces that kind of trains the rest of society to, oh, hey, this is like a really powerful new ticket to kind of get what you want, um, uh, overriding whatever facts or objective uh, issues might be in your way. And people start adopting it en masse uh, and it kind of spreads through society as a kind of generalized technique for for living. (laughs) I mean, I think another long-term trend is is just um, the way that young people are calibrated to discomfort and the kind of level of stoicism uh, and, and suffering they encounter. So you've, you've had for kind of 30 years a gradual decline in um, sports participation all the way from elementary school through college. College kids just don't do intramural sports the way they used to. Um, High school kids, I think, don't generally do as many kind of rough and tumble sports like you and I both do jujitsu. And, you know, if you if you roll with your buddies in jujitsu and get choked down and and get some injuries and, you know, your shoulder gets tweaked and then you go on a campus and people are like, speech is violence. You think, no, what just happened in the dojo was violence. This is 
right? But if if kids don't get exposed to actual kind of broken bones and sports and and fights and physical suffering, and if they have largely a sedentary lifestyle and the only real um, violence they even see is first person shooter games, then you know their calibration about what hurts or what is offensive is so unnatural that you know it starts to become plausible to think, oh, that word hurt me as much as anything in my life has ever hurt me. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's true, but that just means you've had a very, very sheltered life. Yeah, right, right. So you think if people had more uh, difficult childhoods, more sort of encounters with actual violence, they would be more uh, cool with free speech. I think it's not even necessarily violence. I think it's it could even just be how often do they break a sweat? You know, do they have they done hard physical labor right in their lives? I mean, when I was in high school, I I had some jobs that were just really hard physical labor that right. taught me I want to do really well in college, so I never have to do that shit again. I don't know how common that is, but I think that might play into it also. Yeah. Dude, so you know what I did last week for the first time? Uh, I messed with, like, prediction markets. Mm -hmm. I actually put some money down with my buddy Jonathan. Uh, have you ever messed with them? I know about them, but I haven't uh, yeah. used them. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, it, it's kind of interesting because we, we were talking about uh, Trump, basically an attitude towards Trump, and mm -hmm. specifically around the question of, uh, you know, will he last in office? You know, is, is an impeachment uh, or something like that uh, likely? Um, and we, this was before we started talking about the prediction markets. We were just, uh, bullshitting and we were both kind of agreed that our, in, our intuitions were that people are kind of like overestimating the probability of him leaving office in some weird way. Um, so we were like, let's check the markets. Like maybe we'll just for fun. Like, well, so we ended up, uh, looking at it and we thought the price was right. So we put a little bit of money down. This is the first time I ever put money down on a political mm -hmm. bet, mm -hmm. basically betting that Trump will stay in office uh, through the end of the year. Yeah. Because um, it just seemed like there was like a non-trivial amount of people who, who were betting that like... His, what, what are the odds like at the moment? Um, I forget I forget the correct way to kind of put it into that language of odds. Okay. But I'll tell you, like, um, we did it on Predict It, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the political betting markets. And uh, the way that it works is uh, you put down a certain amount uh, and if... Uh, your prediction comes true, it gets paid out um, at like $1. Mm -hmm. So we basically, uh, the shares for the bet that he would stay in office were selling at like 83 cents. Okay. Um, so uh, we bought like X amount of shares. Uh, and, and yeah, if he stays in office until the end of the year, they'll be paid out at a dollar each. Um, and that seemed, like a, that seemed like a pretty good bet to us. What do you think? <laughs> so basically you, you'd make like a 19% profit if he stays in office, but other people are figuring there's like roughly a 17% chance he won't. Something like that. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah I, th I think people are, if you just look at history and like the number of presidents who are in trouble versus the number who actually left office within a small amount of time, it's, yeah, I'm sure people are overestimating this. And also, if you look at how panicked the mainstream media is and how motivated they are to try to make it happen, then <laughs> it seems clear that they're convincing the rest of the country that it's much more likely to happen than it really is. Yes, that was basically exactly our read. Yeah. Um, so we put some money down. I mean, I, I'm I'm interested in this idea of like putting your money where your mouth is. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking a lot about that recently. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's also very similar to the stuff we were talking about before about how, you know, psychology and, you know, all the stuff that we're interested in as, as social scientists uh, and also just as like critics or like, you know, cultural commentators, whatever. Um, like if you're right, then you should have some edge uh, on, on, on other people and you should, you know, be willing to put that out there. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think to bring it back to free speech, you know, maybe it would be good when people are arguing about things that seem completely unsolvable, like, uh, I don't know, what's a controversial idea? 
um, I get into arguments with people about how heritable IQ is, right? Um, if I was arguing with a social justice activist and I could say, look, tell me what evidence would change your mind on this. Give me, give me like, what's the minimum sample size for genome wide association study that had these features and had the, this outcome. Let's make a bet. Let's do a prediction market. Now, the probable response would be, oh, well, no, I mean, you can't quantify it. And I'd be like, yeah, you can. You can. I mean, if you really think IQ is not real and you can't quantify it or it's not genetic, put your money on it. Mm -hmm. um, that is like one of the best ways to know what you're dealing with in a conversation is to, is the, the specifically the question of um, like, what would it take to convince you? Because when someone can't, when someone doesn't have an answer to that question, yeah. it's the surest giveaway that what they're doing is not really intellectually alive. Like it's not actual debating or thinking. It's, it's yeah. like a, it's a completely different game. Yeah. Uh, and people out themselves when, when they're not able to even say under what conditions they would change their mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the sad thing is they don't even know they're outing themselves. They don't even think it's a problem, but yeah, yeah, for, yeah. if you're an objective observer, you can go, oh, okay, you're virtue signaling. That's fine. You do that. Just, you know, leave the serious discussions to the grown ups. So Jeffrey, before England loses you for the summer, I wanted to act actually ask you uh, a kind of personal question, if you would, from personal from my end, um, about uh, just sort of like the intellectual life and um, the academic life or the, uh, the intellectual life, however you want to think about it. Um, and someone like uh, as, you know, uh, as accomplished as you and someone who's, you know, you've, you've not, you've been academically accomplished, but also uh, fairly successful in kind of the popular public realm. Um, so, you know, you've, you've published very well academically and you're respected as a specialist, but you've also written a series of, of popular books that have, have done very well and have had a lot of influence. So I'm very curious, um, cause I don't know that when like next time we'll get to hang out is I'm curious, like, um, if you have any lessons that you could share with me as someone who's like younger and, uh, I'm very much, you know, working towards a, a life of, you know, a, a longer term intellectual life, and I want to write, and I'm writing books, and I and I want to do all kinds of things like that. I'm just curious if you have, if there are any particular like lessons or ideas that uh, you want to share. <laughs> I think the main thing is figure out how uh, how curiosity driven versus ambition driven you are. There mm -hmm. is a trade off in terms of how often you switch your interests and your topics and what fascinates you. And I do not have a very, I can concentrate very, very intensely on topics in the short term, but in the long term, I get bored easily. Okay. So I don't like working on stuff for more than a few years. Mm -hmm. um, that's a terrible way to build a public brand as an intellectual. Mm -hmm. Like you can be known for like a couple things like Chomsky, oh, linguistics and like geopolitics. Or Dawkins, like biology and atheism, uh, it's very hard to be known for half a dozen topics. So if if mm -hmm. if your self assessment is, uh, I I am driven mostly by curiosity. That means I'm going to shift my interests fairly rapidly. You just have to make sure you produce something real and dramatic and public each time you have an interest instead of just kind of getting into it and then being quiet. Okay. About it. So that seems like what you've kind of done. Then. I've tried to do that. It doesn't always succeed. There's a bunch of things I've, I've thought about and worked on that never really resulted in a book or a great paper or whatever. Right. If you can stand to just stay with something publicly and emphasize that again and again and again with minor modifications and build your brand that way, that, that works very, very well. It's not something I could ever do, but the people who do it, I have a lot of respect for. Um, and then just figuring out how the new media landscape is going to work. It's, it's baffling. I mean, traditional publishing is not having a good time. Traditional mm -hmm. mainstream TV and mainstream science journalism is not doing very well. Figuring out how to navigate this new reality of, of, 
social media and YouTube channels and how to build your personal brand in that world is extremely important. And for any young intellectuals who want to have an impact, I think figuring that out and really understanding personal branding and marketing and outreach and um, figuring out your target market and who your audience is and how to engage with them, that's as important as doing you know, your intellectual work and actually reading books and thinking and developing your ideas. Awesome. And what about sort of on the more everyday level of, you know, do you have any uh, hard earned insights about uh, productivity or um, kind of the psychology of, of intellectual performance, whether it be in maybe in the academic context or in the, in the more popular context? I'm not, I'm not one of these guys who does a lot of, serious performance optimization or life hacking, or I don't think that hard about how do I squeeze the most productivity out of every minute. And as a result, I'm probably a fifth as productive as the people I know who really take that seriously. Mm. But um, having a sense of what's important and good intellectual judgment about what problems are interesting, I think actually takes you a long way. There are a lot of people I know mm. who are very productive in terms of like the, the number of books they write, the papers, the grants they get, um, the blogs they write, but so little of it is interesting. And you, you can get pretty far in life with just a moderate work ethic and really good judgment about what's an interesting problem. Okay. That's interesting. Um I think that's hard. I think that would be heartening to a lot of people, you know, because it's like, I think a lot of people are intimidated by the idea that, you know, having a kind of long-term intellectual success or impact mm. is a function of mostly of just like the sheer ability to grind stuff out at a high rate. Um, whereas you're kind of saying actually, you know, having a strong sense of what's really important might in the long run be more important than everyday kind of like hyper productivity. I mean, the people who have had the biggest impact on my field, evolutionary psychology and and biology, often it's just from three or four key papers Mm. that they did by age 32. And even if they never did anything beyond that, they would have shaped the field in an important way. And the key thing is they, 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 but they focused on those papers. They didn't do all the other tempting um, busy work. Mm. that their their peers and colleagues got caught up in. They just had a vision of what they wanted to, to pursue, and they pursued it. And that's that's what I did with my Mating Mind book. There's a lot of other stuff I I could have done and probably could have gotten a much, you know, more successful academic career in terms of prestige in my university and my salary and all that, but I just didn't care enough about that. I wanted to understand how the human mind evolved. That's awesome. Thanks. Well, thanks for sharing that. It'll, it'll help me. Um, so we've been talking for quite a while now. I, I'm thinking if you if you're still awake, um, maybe we just do one more topic. What do you think? Sure. And then we'll rest. Yeah. So we we have a and we I guess when you release this, so you could even do it in like two parts or something. Yeah, we could. Um, yeah, I'll have to think about that. Um, so let's let's go out with a bang, shall we? And uh, would you like to tell us what your wager is for how the world is going to end? Immediately. How the world is going to end. Not immediately, I hope. So hopefully not. But uh, so existential risk is also something that you're interested in. Okay. So the, the, I think the two big threats are artificial intelligence for reasons that have been very well explored by people like Nick Bostrom and well explained by things like Sam Harris's TED Talk about Nick Bostrom's book, Superintelligence. And serious, deep thinkers take this Seriously, you know, Elon Musk is putting a lot of money into reducing existential risk from artificial intelligence. And that's great. There are centers in, in Cambridge and Oxford that are, that are addressing this uh, and Berkeley. So it's a huge problem, but it's getting press. It's getting attention. It's getting money invested in it. I don't know if we'll actually be able to solve it in time. Um, The crucial thing will be convincing China that they have to take it seriously, too, because they're going to be at the cutting edge. They're investing hugely in AI, and I'm not sure they're aware of how dangerous it is. 
The second major risk, I think, is is bioweapons like genetically engineered plagues and specifically ones that are ethnically targeted. Mm. There was a lot of concern about 10 years ago that certain countries like allegedly South Africa, Israel, uh, were, were developing engineered plagues where the idea is you could release it in an area like the Mideast or Southern Africa, but your population would be immune because you have certain genes with certain immune system properties and certain receptor proteins, but other populations would be susceptible. So if conflict developed, then you release this bioweapon, you're safe, they're not. Maybe it kills 20% of you, maybe it kills 90% of them. That's mm -hmm. a win. Wow. So we know that this is technically feasible, right? This could work. Um, however, the media went silent about it. Like it gets almost no coverage. There's almost no um, academic papers about it. And that makes me worried and suspicious that either people don't realize it can happen or they've kind of decided we better not talk about it because it could happen. The more we talk about it, the faster it'll happen. Mm. But I think if we imagine that Russia and China aren't working on this, we're totally delusional. Is the U.S.? Um, I suspect... There are parts of kind of the military that are worried about it. I don't know if we're actively working on developing them. I've got no idea. So how does it work exactly? Could you say a little bit more about how it, how it ethnically discriminates? <clears throat> so basically, you know, every different ethnic group has slightly different sets of genes. Different genes. Oh, but that's all fake. We're all it's equal, different right? Different genetic variants. Well, we're all equal, but we all have so, different <laughs> genes. So anyway. the, the, these weapons surely can't work because we're all equal. Let's not worry about it. Right. Well, they're not discriminating by IQ. They're discriminating by the molecular markers that that shape, you know, how our immune systems work. Got it. Okay, so gone. Um, so the idea is you could engineer a virus or a bacterium uh, that would spread easily, and that would have just a differential lethality rate as a function of which genetic population you happen to be from. Wow. So it so it it specifically focuses on the genes or what exactly it, it wouldn't focus on your your DNA per se it would basically you if you're in group A you'd be able to fight it off because your immune system has certain let's say innate immunity that is protective against it okay but, but group so like remember how the native americans were very very susceptible to smallpox okay more than the europeans right were. sure right so imagine you had a group that kind of engineered something where it treated their own group, you know, the way the Europeans were immune to smallpox, but it treated the other groups as indigenous Americans. Right, right. So I'm, I'm almost certain several countries are working on this very much in secret because of the, the international treaties about bioweapons. But, you know, the concern is that if you... Let's say tensions escalated between, I don't know, I, I doubt China would attack America with this, but let's say tensions escalated between India and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And one of those countries had this and they decided there's an, those populations overlap a lot, but they might decide there's enough, enough distinction between them that we could get a strategic advantage by releasing this. Okay, then what happens? Do all the Pakistanis just die quietly, or do they go nuclear? Right. Um, Man, that's so bonkers. And so it, it, this kind of thing could escalate quickly, but I would be really, really surprised if this sort of thing is not used at some point in the next 30 years on a fairly major scale. Wow. Wow. That's wow. That's a that's quite a prediction. It won't kill all of humanity the way AI might, but um, if the Han Chinese decided hypothetically, well, we've become thirty IQ points smarter than everybody else, and they're all just kind of annoying losers. Let's just take take over. So, is your view that uh, we should be investing way more in trying to figure this out? 
Yeah, at least <laughs> in figuring out how to defend against it. Right. And how to monitor it. Right. And what the kind of geopolitical implications would be if 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 this is like a tool in our toolbox, the way that nukes are a tool and chemical weapons are a tool and cyber warfare is a tool. Um, and if our military strategists aren't paying attention to it, if it's just a blind spot, then that that seems <laughs> bad. Right, right. And on the AI front, do you have a uh, do you have a of of all of the possible catastrophic scenarios, like all the all the bad shit possibilities that Bostrom outlines, for instance? Do you have a do you have one in particular that you think is most likely? I think with AI, um, the trouble is people don't realize how self catalyzing it can become, how the runaway process could start. Mm -hmm. I spent my whole postdoc years at University of Sussex working on evolutionary computer simulations and evolutionary methods for developing neural networks that could then learn. And I'm very familiar with how you can kind of wrap an evolutionary process around a learning process, around a decision-making process, and how that can lead to very rapid escalation of, of abilities. So my worry is you get an AI that is pretty good and where it just kind of asks you politely, look, I just, I need just, I need 10% of the world's computing power just for the next 24 hours. Promise I'll give it back. And then everybody goes, oh, what's the worst that could happen? Let's do that. Um, and then in those 24 hours, it develops a, a, a decisive lead over us where we don't control it anymore. Right. And we don't really know. It's not just we don't control its capabilities. We don't control its values and its goals yeah. anymore. Because evolution is very powerful at mm -hmm. creating new values and goals and priorities. So then if you have this kind of runaway evolving AI and it's got sort of priorities and morals that we don't understand or control. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll be nice. Maybe it'll be, maybe it'll have a sense of noblesse oblige. Like, oh, it, it would be good to, to be nice to my creators. Um, but maybe it'll think these, these half-wit primates are just, uh, uh, like, I'll keep a few of them around to maintain the computational infrastructure, but the rest that are just, they can go away. So is it that you think the, the, the negative outcomes are more likely than the positive outcomes, or do you just think that they're so bad that they deserve uh, way more investment in ensuring that they don't happen? <clears throat> I think they're certainly so bad that like, personally, I would, I would like, if I was some kind of, mold buggy and dictator, I'd be like devoting at least 5% of GDP to solving this problem. Mm -hmm. Like massive, massive resources. See, I buy that argument, but I also, um, I'm, I don't, I'm not unconvinced about the, the friendly AI, uh, scenarios. Mm -hmm. I think they seem plausible also. So I, I personally, my own read of it is that I don't, I don't, I haven't been convinced that the negative possible scenarios are more likely than the, the positive uh, friendly AI scenarios. But I agree with you that the, the, the risks are so great that it certainly deserves way more interest than anyone is giving to it right now. And especially because, you know, what's incentivized is the experimentation and the development of yeah. the powers. And so it's like, again, I, I, you can kind of think of this also as like a major kind of problem of capitalism, I think, in some sense. Yeah. Because like, just, you know, almost like senselessly risky uh, developments are always encouraged and incentivized and these these uh, investments in safety are always kind of given short shrift in a kind of market system, I think. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the dif difficult bullet that we have to bite is that if we take these AI risks seriously and if we have, let's say, international moratorium that say you can't do certain kinds of research, that we have to take it as seriously as like, nuclear technology. We have to be willing to send in SEAL Team 6 to take out that AI lab at MIT if they're being naughty. 
Mm-hmm. That's that's how seriously we have to take it. It can't just be, oh, you guys are bad. Your grad students did this and that. And, uh, <laughs> they won't get jobs now. No, it has, you know, it has to be a serious geopolitical um, moratorium. And and personally, I'd be happy with saying we just shouldn't research this until maybe the 22nd century, maybe the 24th, like that kind of time scale to a Darwinian. We're very patient. There's no reason to do it in this century if it has even a 1% chance of extinguishing humanity. It's super fascinating. Um, but it is hard to imagine how you could possibly achieve that as a, just as a co- given the coordination problems yeah. and given, you know, the nature of global capitalism. Yeah. So I think, um, it seems like capitalism is such that it has locked us onto a path of we're going there and we're going there faster and faster. And there's probably no, I mean, I agree with you. I just don't see, um, I, I don't see any mechanism for uh, containing it. Yeah. I mean, nuclear nonproliferation trees worked pretty well, but it's, it's a lot harder to, you know, develop enriched uranium and to, program and AI. Um, but so it might be the, it might be one of the hardest problems that humans have ever faced, but we should face it for sure. For sure. Um, I think maybe that's a good point to wrap it up on. What do you think? Dude, this has been awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. We've covered so a million bases. This has yeah. been a pretty crazy conversation. We talked about yeah. like multiple ways the world, the world could end. We talked about China free speech. We talked about blockchain polyamory. This has been awesome, man. Thank you so much for doing it. It was really fun. My pleasure. My (laughs) pleasure, Justin. All right, dude.